1956, John Lennon was a 16-year-old troublemaker. School for John did little more than provide the inspiration for his outlandish prank. When he was six, John's father disappeared on a merchant ship. John was left in the care of his Aunt Mimi. His free-spirited mother, Julia, became more like an affectionate friend. John's musical career began at age 10 with a harmonica given to him by his Uncle George. When Skiffle hit England, Mimi bought him a guitar. John soon formed his own group, the Quarrymen. The Quarrymen copied all of Lonnie Donegan's numbers. But from the beginning, John, like other Liverpool teenagers, wanted to play rock and roll. Paul McCartney had never met John Lennon. Paul was 14 years old and went to a different school. Unlike John, Paul was well-behaved, reserved and eager to please. Paul's father, a part-time musician, bought his son a guitar to help him through the sorrow of his mother's death. Soon Paul was also driven by a passion to play hard rock and roll. Like his new heroes, Little Richard, Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly. In the summer of 1957, Paul attended a local church festival in nearby Woolton. The entertainment that day was the Quarrymen. A mutual friend introduced Paul to John. Paul was impressed that John had a band. John was impressed that Paul could tune a guitar. The following week, Paul became one of the Quarrymen. Their first year together was neither glamorous nor lucrative. While still schoolboys, they struggled for every chance to play, carrying their equipment on buses, suffering in different audiences, rarely getting paid, but dreaming of stardom. We had all these canard ships going over to the States, and a lot of Liverpudlians worked on these ships. Uh, they were known as canard yanks. And they would bring all these fabulous records back, which nobody had except Liverpudlians. And the groups used to grab these records, all these good Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran records, and they used to mine them. One of those groups copying records was the Quarrymen, now consisting of John and Paul, both playing rhythm guitars, and two new members, a 16-year-old lead guitarist, George Harrison, and an art college friend of John's, Stuart Sutcliffe. To his classmates, George Harrison was the boy whose father drove the bus they all rode to school. The youngest of four children, George was the family favorite. But even as a small child, he had an independent and solitary nature. In 1956, George acquired his first guitar. Playing it did not come as naturally to him as to his friend Paul McCartney. But he was patient and determined. His mother sat up with him night after night as he taught himself to pick out Buddy Holly songs. George trailed after the quarrymen, hoping to join. But John Lennon tended to see George, all of 14, as not much more than a child. He was eventually accepted, not only for his guitar playing, but also because his mother could tolerate their noisy rehearsals. Stuart Sutcliffe, on the other hand, was the most promising artist at the Liverpool Art College. A classmate of John's, he developed an interest in rock and roll as a way of enhancing his bohemian image at school. He couldn't play a note, but was in anyway once he bought a guitar with the money he'd won in a local art exhibition. With the new members came changes in name. First, Johnny and the Moondogs. Then, the Silver Beatles. Finally, in 1960, the Beatles. The first gigs outside the college was at the Jacaranda which was a, a tiny uh, little coffee bar where they played in the cellar. I think they got about uh, five shilling each. 
The Jacaranda was owned by Alan Williams, a small-time entrepreneur operating on Liverpool's Bohemian Fringe. His latest enterprise was supplying rock and roll groups to a club in Hamburg. When no other act was available, Williams proposed the Beatles. The group that was playing there was one of the, the big groups in Liverpool, which was uh, Derry and the Seniors, featuring Howie Casey, the lead. And he sent me a letter over saying, look, Alan, we've got a good thing going over here for all the Liverpool groups. But if you send that bum group, the Beatles, over to Hamburg, you're going to louse it all up. For God's sake, don't send them. Now, the Beatles were going through one of their drummerless periods. They had been playing at the Cash Bar Club run by Mrs. Best, whose son was Pete Best, who played drums. And so they introduced me to Pete, and I said, OK, play me a drum roll, let's see how good you are. And he played, not too cleverly, but passable. And I said, OK, that's good enough. Now let's go to Hamburg. Uh, Hamburg was the Las Vegas of Europe. It was exciting, uh, it was full of life. They had a license to do everything. Alan Williams had booked the Beatles into two dreary clubs, the Kaiser Keller and the Indra, where for the next two months, they played a back-breaking schedule of up to seven hours a night. Although Stuart, their oldest member, had only just turned 20, the Beatles, having grown up in a seaport town, were far from naive. Yet their eyes were opened by the abundance of sex, drugs and drink that Hamburg offered. The rough life and the long hours far from home hardened them and their music. The band got tighter and their repertoire expanded. They were no longer that bum group that nobody wanted. They were professionals. They came back from Hamburg uh, still as an unknown band. I started uh, promoting them as the sort of big band. Though they weren't really the big band in Liverpool, I sort of promoted them like that because they were close friends of mine. And um, a promoter, Brian Kelly, had uh, realised their talent and he, he'd booked them on all his uh, jive-highs, which were the, um, the, the big gigs at the time, Aintree Institute and Little and Town Hall. The Cairns opened at Little and Town Hall and there was just these guys on stage. At the time, everybody was into uniformity, wearing uh, the same clothes. And these guys with hair longer than what I'd ever seen in my life. And I think sort of jeans and leather jackets, just anyway, smoking cigarettes, you know, just up there doing it and having a ball. The moment the Beatles struck up and did their stomping, Everybody, every kid froze, and then they all run to the stage and started screaming. Following their debut at Liverland Town Hall, the Beatles became sought after by small dance hall owners throughout Liverpool. Not until they went to Hamburg again in 1960 did they make their first record. And then, only as a backup group for their friend Tony Sheridan. The result? An awkward rock and roll arrangement of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. It was intended only for German release. More significant than that first record was Stu Sutcliffe's decision to remain in Germany to paint and to be with his German fiancée, Astrid. When the Beatles returned to Liverpool and the cabin, Paul was playing bass. Hi, I'm Gary. The Complete Beatles continues on the USA Special. Bob Wooler, a postal clerk with an encyclopedic knowledge of all the Liverpool bands, had recently become a part-time DJ at the Cavern, the local jazz club. <laughs> when he began booking groups for the club's lunchtime sessions, among them were the Beatles. Hi there, all you cave dwellers. This is Bob Willow saying welcome to the Best of Cellars. We've got the high by high and the lights down low, so here we go.
Newman converts it to rock and roll, with the Beatles as one of its regular bands. By the fall of 1961, the Beatles were local stars in Liverpool and Hamburg. But playing the cavern and the German clubs had become routine and a dead end. They seemed to have progressed as far as any group could, outside the musical mecca of London. Since the scene was so controlled by the London moguls, um, who didn't want to know anybody from the provinces, uh, people believed, and the Beatles believed, and all the Liverpool groups believed, that uh, they enjoyed the music, they played the music, they'd make a few bob, and that was that. And it was only, I think, when Brian Epstein actually came on the scene and um, was telling us how much money can be made, that we could actually make a record. Because none of us ever anticipated making records. I hadn't had anything to do with uh, pop management, management of pop artists, before uh, that day that I went down to the Cavern Club and heard the Beatles playing. And um, this was quite a new world, really, for me. Brian Epstein wasn't much of a rock and roll fan. His own leanings were towards theatre and light classical music. But as manager of the record department in his father's furniture store, he followed pop music as a business necessity. Had there not been several requests for the Sheridan Beatles, My Bonnie, Brian never would have visited a place like the Cavern. I was immediately struck by the their, their music, their beat, and uh, their sense of humour, actually, on stage. And even afterwards, when I met them, I was struck again by their personal charm. And uh, it was there that, really, it all started. Though he knew nothing about managing a group, Brian convinced the Beatles that he had the connections to make them famous. His family had money and owned record shops. And the fact that he would have some pull in the music industry suddenly began to make people realize that he could um, maybe have some influence in getting them uh, to become a national name. Before Brian could get them their national name, he'd have to make a few changes. When Brian took them over, he had plastic type photographs, he had them all done in the suits. He really smoothed out their image. John would give me all photographs of them taken in Hamburg, pictures of him. Uh, on stage with a toilet seat round his neck or uh, pictures of him reading the newspaper in his underpants in the Reaper barn. And as soon as Brian took them over, John came rushing round to me asking for all these pictures back because uh, Brian wouldn't allow that sort of image with his boys. In spite of Brian's efforts, the Beatles' horizon seemed hopelessly narrow. A third trip to Hamburg only darkened their sombre mood. Stuart Sutcliffe had been suffering from severe headaches ever since the group had been jumped by a gang of toughs two years earlier in Liverpool. The day before they arrived, Stuart had died of a brain hemorrhage. Stunned by the death of Stuart and bored with playing the same old clubs, the Beatles needed some good news. Brian Epstein walked into my office one day and said he'd got a group that he wanted me to hear. Brian had apparently taken one of his tapes into the EMI store in Oxford Street to get it transferred to disc. And the engineer heard it and thought it was very good. Brian told him how he'd been to every record company in the country and uh, hadn't got any, anywhere with it. And he saw me because I had a reputation at that time for being rather screwball and, and uh, rebellious. And uh, I would take any nutty thing like the Beatles. George Martin was as unlikely a producer for a rock and roll group as Brian Epstein was a manager. Although trained as a classical musician, he'd been producing eccentric comedy records at Parlophone, a specialty label owned by EMI. Ever on the alert for new ideas, Martin was intrigued by the demo Brian played. The music wasn't frightfully original. There were no great songs there. It was just the sound was interesting. I arranged a, a recording test with them in Abbey Road number three studio, which meant I was going to spend a couple of hours with them finding out what they could do. They had a very, very funny version of Please Please Me, which was rather slow. They did have Love Me Do. Um, weird things like Fat Swallows, Your Feet's Too Big, or Till There Was You. I got them to sing lots of different things to find out which voice was good. I was looking for the Cliff Richard or the Elvis Presley or the Tommy Steele, saying, now, is Paul going to be the main one, or is John going to be the main one? And George, well, he's obviously not got such a good voice as the other two. And then it suddenly hit me right between the eyes. Why the hell should I find the solo singer? Why not just have a lot of them if they are? 
It wasn't their music that sold them to me. It was their charm. They were very charming people. George Martin signed them and set a recording date. But there would be one more change before then. Pete Best was probably the best looking of the bunch. He was very quiet with a sullen kind of charm. Pete initially in Liverpool was the most popular member of the Beatles, particularly with the girl fans. And whenever the Beatles used to appear, all the girls used to shout and scream for Pete. But he couldn't play drums very well. I mean, couldn't keep in time too well. And I was aware that the band weren't tight. They, they needed that sort of binding force that a good drummer should give them. So I said to Brian, well, I'll get another drummer for the recording sessions. You can do what you like with, with him on stage. But we'll have someone else on, on, on the tracks. And I didn't realize until afterwards that they'd been thinking the same thing anyway. The Beatles' new drummer was Richard Starkey, better known around Liverpool as Ringo Starr. Ringo hailed from a Liverpool slum called the Dingle, but spent most of his childhood in and out of hospitals. When the skiffle craze hit, he acquired a set of drums, began to sit in with local groups, and eventually joined one of the Beatles' chief Liverpool competitors, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. When the Beatles needed a temporary drummer in Liverpool, Ringo would sit in. This time, he joined for good. Well, I want to see the reproduction of... No, I, I, I'm... Uh... Obviously, I haven't rehearsed this. I'm <laughs> thinking as I do it. Or not thinking as I do it. I just want to see what... See, they did this. This came out really good. This is really thin, like the original. Here's the original. Thin. Fold it over, and here is the reissue. Thin, fold it over. That looks really good. It looks really good. I mean, this box, from what I can see so far, is something you really are going to treasure because it's like the original, and you're getting the whole set for 300 bucks or whatever. Um, let's just look at Sgt. Pepper. See, see what, see what's going on there. I'll tell you something. You got to really be careful with these plastic uh, outer sleeves that have the. Um, to stick them. If you're not care, I mean, this is general, not just this. If you're not careful with these, and it rubs against another record when it's not closed, and it's a paper jacket, it's going to take up the paper. It's going to ruin the record. So the jacket. So be really careful with that. This looks really nice. This just, you know, without taking. Well, I'll do. It. I'll do it. Right now, so. Okay, so here it is. It's a little bluer. It's a little more saturated, but it's got that real nice quality that the original had. There's a certain quality of, I can't even explain it, it's kind of like mystical. And the reissue has it, it's, it's got all the qualities. It really does. And The red's slightly redder. This is slightly oranger, but it's 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 really close. It's very very close. Like like I have to look. Okay, I know this. The reissue has a slightly bluer, so I know that's it. And does it have all the stuff inside? Of course, it's gonna have all the stuff inside. Look, they gave they gave you the original uh, sleeve and the thing that. If you found a used copy owned by a child who cut it all out and wore the mustache and whatever, it was kind of annoying. And then on this side they have the industry. Okay, that's very cool. I can't wait to play that. All right, and then let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass by um, help and well, I'll show them to you. You know why not? Do. But they really do look good. They really look. Okay, now we get to Magical Misery Tour. Now, Magical Misery Tour, um, 
you know, this never came out in the UK as a full album when, when the original came out, which came out as two uh, EPs that I have over there. I should have taken that down, but I didn't. Uh, but this is the original American mono, which is very rare, actually. It didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't produced in large numbers because by then people were buying stereo. I got this copy at uh, Rhino Records in, Los, in Westwood, and they didn't know what it was because it was in the dollar bin. So, because it says M-A-L on the bottom, not S-M-A-L. So I knew I was getting a mono for a buck, and I took it out. It was in perfect shape. I got all tingly inside. And it's interesting because it's got a different version of, uh, of Blue Jay Way without all the uh, stuff in the background. So the first time I played it, it was kind of jarring. And of course, the, the second side is not in, is in the mono, which is how the tapes uh, were originally sent by George Martin to to Capitol. And they made fake stereo for the stereo version, which was, you know, bad. And now here's the reissue, and it says MAL, it's there. And uh, here it is. And, oh, there's Dave Dexter's fingerprint right there. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, here's something interesting. Does the is, is there a typo on the original? Because there's a typo on this one. Yeah, they made a typo. Leave it to me to find it. Okay, this one's really blurry, but it says factory in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Los Angeles, California, Jacksonville, Florida. That's on the original, okay? The reissue says factory Scranton, Pennsylvania, Los Angeles, A-N-G-E-L-S. No one caught it. Jacksonville, Illinois. Was it Jacksonville, Illinois or Jacksonville, Florida? Jacksonville. This the original is so blurry. Yeah, it is Illinois. But they they got, it says, Los Angeles, the Angels. That's what it really is, you know. A lot of people will say, People will come to this country to learn how to speak English. Let them go to uh, the angels and the blood of Christ, and the body of Christ and uh, uh, Saint Francis. Oh no, it's San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, okay, I don't want to get political. Okay, anyway, it's a nice matte cover the way the original is. The book looks really nice, and uh, when they find out about the typo, someone's gonna shit. If you haven't seen Love, by the way, in Las Vegas, don't miss it. I've seen it twice. You can see it ten times and sit in a different seat. You'll see a whole different show. The sound is crazy good in surround sound. And the whole show is, you know, if you're a Beatle fan, which if you're watching this, you obviously are, because otherwise it would be very sad. You know, I've been watching myself over there instead of watching you. I'm sorry. Uh, now, the White Album. Here's here's the one. Uh, oh, my number is 901-3264. Nine oh one three. Now my original is o three eight four nine eight one, and of course it's a top loader. This was sent to me by a reader. He g gave this to me, which was awfully nice. He wasn't a Beatles fan, which I can't even. I don't understand how somebody could not be a Beatles fan, but that's the way it is. So. Uh, it's got all the pictures. It's got everything in it. It's got the black, the black inner sleeve, top loader. You know, I went to the UK. Uh, I guess it was the early '90s, or maybe it's late '90s, and I went to a used record store in Islington, and they had about ten or fifteen copies of top loaders, and they were selling them at that point for like. 75 to 100 dollars and they were mostly in good shape i only bought one i should have bought them all because they've all appreciated greatly in value since then and if i insult you by doing the english voice tough shit okay all right now here's the reissue this is probably the toughest one to get no they did a pretty good job of it it's sufficiently the paper sufficiently thick to give it the feel of the original fold it over numbered 
It's embossed. It's raised. Black innards. I'm not going to pull them all the way out, but they're, it's black. And it's, it's just as much it's difficult pulling this out as it is the original. And here's now this is an interesting thing. I don't know whether you if you know this or not, but let's let's see what they did with this. I'm sure they did it right. But on the American cop originals of this, I know this sounds totally crazy, but it's true. Okay, so you see John and Yoko, the squeal drawing. You see they have genitals. You see that? If you look at your American copy, if you've got an original American, capital airbrushed out the genitals. That's how sick things were in this country then. They're actually as sick now as they were then, but they actually airbrushed out the genitals. And then also, speaking of airbrushing out, um, there's, okay, here's, there's Paul. All right, it's Paul. If you look in that picture, I think it's Paul. I, I know it's John, it's John. If you look, he's, he's split between, there's a thing between, and the, you can see pubic hair. There's pubic hair there. God, these guys were men. If you look at the American copy, they airbrushed out the pubic hair. That's how sick things were. This has it. This has everything. Looks good. We're almost done. Okay? We're almost done.